Jane drinks Diet Coke first thing in the morning. That's yes. one thing I know. I try to stop, and I went for about three days, and I didn't mind the sleepiness, but I did mind that everything was now meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to introduce David Francis. David Francis is the author of two novels. The first one was Agapanthus Tango, and the second one was Stray Dog Winter, which won many prizes. Um, was shortlisted for the Lambda Literary Award. And he's hard at work on something funny. Um, and he's from Australia, and the way that we met was at the Sydney Writers Festival, we met in an elevator. I was carrying Horse Heaven, and he complimented me on... On your height. <laughs> no, <laughs> you con complimented me on how I described the front legs oh. of a horse. And it, and it was a wonderful compliment, and I went, Because <laughs> David grew up on a horse uh, farm in, uh, near Melbourne and knew a lot about horses. Where Jane has visited. Yes. Um, at the Melbourne Writers Festival. Thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ted, for putting this great series together. And, and what a lineup, and what an honor to be part of that. Yes, really. Um, so to introduce Jane, um, Jane was born here in Los Angeles, but I never LA know. LA County Hospital. I never know where. where. But where did you live? Down the road from LA County Hospital. How old were you when you left? About a year. Okay, so you, you don't remember so much. Not a thing. And then you moved. <laughs> then you moved to Webster Grove, Missouri, which is outside outside of St. Louis. Um, suburban was it then? Oh yeah, it's a suburb. What's your connection with the, I'm, I know we're supposed to be getting through the, the bio, but what's your connection with rural, rural parts of the Midwest? Desire. Okay. I mean, my connection to rural things always started with horses. So because that's where horses lived, mm -hmm. that's where I wanted to be. The first time I interviewed Jane, which was some many years ago, the first question I asked her was, uh, something about her having worked in an archaeological dig in Egypt and how that Greece. related digging at Greece. No, I'm sorry, no, in England, in England. In England. Winchester, England, yeah. Well, in <laughs> England is the Greece What's of the, the British Isles. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I was trying to make this connection between sort of fossicking around right to write a novel and how was, were there any parallels between those two experiences, and I didn't really know Jane then and as well, and she looked at me and she just said, no. And, <laughs> and that was sort of the inauspicious beginning of that interview. Um, anyway, I survived that, and here we are today. Jane obtained an A.B. in literature from Vassar, mm -hmm. which is a B.A., but back to front something in, like in, that. in the Latin, <laughs> what, the something baccalaureus or something. Um, she earned an M.A. and M.F.A. and a Ph.D. from the University of Iowa. She spent a year studying in Iceland as a Fulbright, from 81 to 80, 96, she was a professor of English at Iowa. State. State. University. Feel free to um, <laughs> intervene at any time. She now lives uh, with Jack, um, who was her contractor that never left, which is such a wonderful story, in Carmel Valley in uh, Northern California. She published her first novel, Barn Blind, in 1980, won an O. Henry Prize, O. Henry Award after that, for a short story called Lily. And then, of course, uh, she was lucky enough and deserving enough to receive the Pulitzer Prize for A Thousand Acres, which, of course, is, was based on King Lear. Shakespeare, right? I think that's <laughs> yeah. what his name was, something like that. Right, um, which was adapted into a film in 95. She wrote for television, producing an episode of Homicide. Well, they said I did. Is that not true? No, With Henry... they didn't use a thing. Oh. That. <laughs> oh. But Henry Bromel was my teacher at God the Iowa Henry Writers. God bless Henry Bromel. God bless him. He was a wonderful teacher uh, at Iowa and um, a wonderful person. And so who died quite suddenly last year and lived quite near here. Mm -hmm. And a number of you would have known Henry. Henry. Um, Age of Grief, which was a novella, which became the 2002 film, The Secret Lives of Dentists. Which is a really good movie, and I like it a lot even better, even though they never even sent me a free ticket. And it's nice to hear someone say that they're excited about the movie uh, into which their novel was made. Then the, the nonfiction 13 Ways of Looking at a Novel, which was 2005-ish, mm -hmm. um, which is a meditation on the history of the novel, starting with The Tale of Genji, which was when? 
1004. 1004, going right through to, uh, was it Alice Munro? What did you end no, with? No, the last person, the last person was um, uh, Egan, Egan, Egan. Oh, Jennifer, Jennifer uh, Egan. Jennifer Egan, yeah. That's right, I knew that. Um, Jane's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, she chaired the judges panel for the prestigious, the first Man Booker International Prize. No, it was prize. the third, but the first woman. Oh, God, she's going to correct me at every turn. Absolutely, of course. <laughs> Accuracy is really important. And she was recently appointed, and this is just a plug for Penn, uh, to the advisory board of, of Penn Center USA. Her other novels include, we better get this over with or we'll never have a chance. <laughs> um, Jane is very prolific. Her other Let novels me say the favorites. I'll say my favorites. Okay. Okay. Um, Horse Heaven, Moo, yeah. The All Two Travel Adventures of Liddy Newton, and The Greenlanders. The Greenlanders, good for you. I was hoping you'd say The Greenlanders. Um, there are about 11 more. There are, there's a number, there are a number of young adult novels, five Horse or six books, now. Yeah, five. Which, I mean, you speak to Jane on the phone and she doesn't, we talk about stuff and horses and blah, blah, blah. And then the next thing, there's a, she, she has a book out. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> she just finished the one before a minute ago. So she's very prolific. Um, and a wonderful reader and a wonderful writer, and it's a great pleasure to welcome. Oh, and she also um, <laughs> wrote a book called Catskill Crafts, which is sort of a segue into saying she made her own dress. This is a Jane Smiley knitted <laughs> outfit. Um, so I stand up and turn. So I'm going to tell a story about this. Um, this. Uh, this pattern came from a book by a woman named Barbara G. Walk. She was a pattern inventor, and she's pretty old now, but I think she's still alive. And Where only, is she? she she's, I think she's up in the Bay Area. And the only novel she ever wrote was called Amazon, and it was about a, an Amazon who is reincarnated into the world. And every time a man is not nice to a woman, she kills him. <laughs> <laughs> And she made she's she's spent her whole life writing um, essays about feminism and concocting knitting patterns. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a very interesting. How person. how many men were killed in the in the book? Oh, quite a few. Wow. <laughs> She um, never gave them a chance to apologize, either. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of books, we're here to talk about, sorry to get us back on track, um, Jane's new novel, Some Luck, uh, published here by Knopf. Jane's been on a big book tour and is heading to the UK. I just saw her schedule, um, or her schedule as it will be, mm. um, which is amazingly intense. Um, so it's a, it's a big thrill to be on an old-fashioned book tour, but I'm sure exhausting, but you look remarkably well on it, Thanks. I will say. Um, so Some Luck, some luck uh, chronal, chronicles an Iowa farm family from 1920 through to 1953, and it's part, the first part of a trilogy, mm -hmm. um, which will be uh, two other novels, which I'm amazed to hear are actually done. Um, but it's a, a moving meditation on this family and life on a farm during those 50-odd years. Uh, well, 30-odd 30 years, 33, 33 years. 33 years, yeah. To be exact. Thank you, Jane, for um, <laughs> rectifying that. Um, and He's like a little brother, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like a big sister, and so the instinct is always to correct. You know? Yes, I've, I've noticed that. Um, the novel begins in Denby, Iowa, which is a fictional town. Yes, it's a fictional town. And it's based on the story of Rosanna and Walter Langdon and their numerous children, who are all, all very different. Uh, there's Frank, who is precocious and kind of fantastic, and Joey, who's more the farm boy, the good boy. Um, and then there's, he's sort of a sensitive, earthy type. And then there's Lillian, who's charming and good. And Henry, who's strange and orderly and reads all the time, which I was saying to Jane before, Henry reminds me most of Jane. And then there's Claire, who's younger and naughty and doesn't have very good eyesight. Um, <laughs> well, she has to wear glasses, which is her great tragedy, you know, because she just doesn't like her looks. She's sad about having to wear glasses. Yeah. Um, and... But she's only 14 or so. Well, at this stage. Yeah. yeah. So, we, yeah. I mean, we'll learn more about her in the future because yes. she's the baby. So let's first talk about the title um, and in the context of the, the, the possibility of 
a discussion about luck versus faith, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had a book called Good Faith, Good which faith. is really about yeah. the real estate world in yes. Northern California, not so much about faith. But let's talk about, um, we, we'll get to the sex after we talk about the religion. Okay. Um, but the, this sort of meditation on, on luck versus faith and Rosanna, the mother, who is a, a woman who's, who's raised Catholic, and then they go to a revival and she ends up sort of becoming a more avid Pentecostalist type yes. person. Well, Rosanna, and they live in a small town, but like most small towns in those days, there's several churches. Walter and his relatives, who are British, um, British of British extraction, they go to one of the Protestant churches, and Rosanna's relatives are of German Catholic extraction. So they don't know each other very well, so in some sense they're crossing a line to get married, and in order to get married, um, Rosanna sort of puts religion to one side. Mm -hmm. And then a bad thing happens, which I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'll tell you after. <laughs> <laughs> and Rosanna is devastated by this. And um, they understand that there is a revival up in Mason City, which is not too far away, um, by Billy Sunday. Does that, how many of you have ever heard of Billy Sunday? A few. Um, and that surprises me because he's, he was really quite famous in his day. Billy Sunday was probably the first true revivalist. He, he did a lot of tent revivals. And he started out uh, as a baseball player. He was from Story County, Iowa. He had spent part of his childhood in an orphanage. And he went to play for the Cubs, for Cap Anson. And he was well known for, for stealing bases. And he played baseball for about seven years, and then he saw the light and became a revivalist. But his, and his, his big issue was alcohol um, and inveighing against um, taking, drinking a lot of liquor and stuff. And his Stealing bases seems, strikes me as a perfect background for <laughs> being a religious man. Well, it might have been, you know, and his patented entry was he would run from back there and slide um, onto mm -hmm. the stage. And then he'd jump up and talk about demon, demon rum. <laughs> uh, and he was quite famous. And so when Walter and Rosanna go to see him, um, he's a little bit toward the end of his career. But Rosanna is moved, and she decides she's going to um, she decides she's going to be, be, what's the word, canning? He's gonna, she's going to be revived. Saved, she's in effect. She's going to be saved. She's oh, going to be yeah, saved, right. but not saved. in... I was not raised in a... <laughs> I wasn't raised in a religious household, so the terminology doesn't come to me very quickly. Yeah. Um, but so that's a theme in, um, this, in the 1930s when they're going through the Depression. Mm. And, and, and more bad stuff happens around her in a way that she, um, she says... Rosanna, the mother, um, her own avid Bible reading did not ease her feelings. Um, and then she prays, there's a scene that perhaps you might read from, if we can oh. find it, where she, she prays for the, the water to come because the well uh, is well, dry. She, she's got, Lillian is her child who's now three and a half, she's, or three and three quarters about, and it's the summer of 1930, which was a very hot summer. There was so much information on an Iowa State website that I could have tra tracked the, the temperature and the rainfall and the snowfall in every county in Iowa for, all, for every day of every year, starting in about 1900. Well, because the weather was a big deal on yeah. the farms. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, so this is a very hot summer, and um, I'm just going to read a little section about uh, something that happened. The moment when Rosanna knew she'd been living in a fool's paradise was the moment she pumped the second basin of water. She'd already undressed Lillian and set her into the first tub of water to cool off. It would certainly be a hundred out there at least. And Lillian was paddling mildly and dipping a couple of spoons in and out of her bath. She was half talking to Rosanna. As she said, Molly and Lizzie need a nap. And Rosanna answered automatically, I'm sure they do. They were up late last night. The water that spurted out of the tap over the sink 
fell brown and thick into the pail and then stopped. Rosanna had never seen a well grow dry before. She set the pail down into the sink, put her hands in her la on, her, on her hips. Her hands were trembling. The farm had three wells, one beside the barn, this one by the house, and an old one that had been capped some years ago, not far from the chicken house. Rosanna had no idea how deep this well was or how it compared with the others. Sometimes that didn't matter. Water could be deep or shallow. She glanced over at Lillian. The tub the girl was sitting in was not at all large. It had a flat bottom and flared sides about 12 inches tall, and Lillian was sitting with her legs crossed. The water, which was clear, came up about six inches. In the hot weather, Rosanna had been letting her sit in the water every afternoon just to stave off any fevers or heat strokes that might be going around. Walter and the boys had a pail outside, too, in the shade, and they dipped their bandanas in before wrapping them around their heads under their hats or wrapping them around their mouths and nose to keep, noses to keep out the dust. The other thing Rosanna had taught the boys to do was to dip their wrists in the water and hold them in there long enough for the blood to cool. Well, obviously, the first thing was to pray. So Rosanna set down the pail and went over to Lillian and knelt beside her. She said, Dear Lord, and Lillian said, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray. Rosanna couldn't help smiling. She waited for Lillian to finish and went on. We see that you are preparing a trial for us. The signs and the symbols are all around us. You give us no rain, and now you have dried up our well. Our crops are thirsty, Lord. We dole out little drops of moisture to them every evening, and they drink them up, but still they look yellow and dry. She was thinking of the beans. We thank you for your past generosity, and we apologize if we have seemed ungrateful, if we have sat down to your bounty without lifting our voices in your praise. We understand that we became proud and flaunted our pride and were punished. Now she was thinking about how Bruno Krauss had come and gone. No customers could afford to pay for pastries. And she had had to slaughter half of her chickens and given them away. And though at first the experience was a bitter one, it showed her that there were people, and not just bums and vagrants, but people in Denby and Usherton who hadn't the wherewithal to buy a chicken. There were people who were starving in the midst of plenty, as it's said in the Bible somewhere. We know that the trials you send us are proper tests of our faith, and we hope to pass those tests, dear Lord. Now she was thinking that Dan Crest was giving her almost, no, almost nothing for her butter, good as it was. But he said the people didn't care about quality when they could hardly afford to eat. He himself almost went out of business, and it could still happen if the drought, yes, he used the dreaded word, didn't end soon. He had no idea what was next, and neither did Hoover nor anyone else. The oat and barley fields were brown, and there weren't many farmers like Walter and his father who had some from the year before. The corn looked like green sticks thrusting out of rock. She gripped Lillian's hand a little too tightly, and Lillian pulled away. She opened her eyes. Lillian said, Mama, I'm scared. You scared me. And Rosanna coughed and said, You pray, Lillian. The Lord will listen to you, I'm sure. Pray what? Rosanna thought for a second and said, Darling, just close your eyes and say, Dear Father, please have mercy upon your children and keep us and protect us. If there's anything we have done to offend you, we give you our apologies. Say that. What are apologies? Saying you're sorry, you know, like when you make a mess and Mama has to clean it up. Did I make a mess? No, honey, no, no, you didn't, you didn't, I don't know who did, but sometimes you have to say you're sorry and you don't know why. Do you understand? Lillian shook her head. Someday you will. We don't know all the things the Lord sees. Sometimes he sees things that we don't and they make him sad and angry. So we have to say we're sorry anyway. Okay. <laughs> but she still seemed doubtful. Rosanna began again. Dear Father, Dear Father, oh, perfect. The bells. <laughs> Please take mercy upon us, your children, and help us. Please help us. 
Lillian didn't correct her. If we have offended you by doing something, we are sorry. We are sorry if, if we did a bad thing that we didn't know. Darling, said Rosanna, it might be that someone else did a bad thing, but it's good if we apologize for it, like Jesus. Like Jesus? Well, <laughs> Jesus never did a single bad thing, but when he was crucified, he made up for all the bad things that other people had done. That's why he was crucified. Lillian looked at her for a moment, then went back to moving her fingers in the water, and Rosanna wondered if she had gone too far. It was always a shock for a child to find out, truly understand what had happened to Jesus. Rosanna remembered clearly her own reaction of brooding over it for some weeks around Easter and asking questions. Nails in his palms? Nails? He fell down three times and nobody at all helped him? Where was the good Samaritan? <laughs> in fact, it was better to have a rather thoughtless child like Frankie who listened and then forgot about it. <laughs> who at 10 still sang round John Virgin without recognizing that those words made no sense. Finally, Lillian said without looking at her, Did you do a bad thing, Mama? Not that I know of. Did Papa? Not that I know of. Frankie? She hesitated, but certainly this was true. Not that I know of. Then, at this point, Joey? I can't imagine Joey or you, Lillian, doing a bad thing or thinking a bad thought. What is a bad thought? Lillian regretted even beginning this. She said, hating someone. Do you hate anyone? No, and neither does Papa or Frankie or Joey or you, Lillian. I don't know why there isn't any water, but the Lord will provide if we pray to him. Isn't there any water? Well, said Lillian, let's see. She stood up and lifted Lillian out of the tub, careful to retain as much of that water as she could for plants and maybe even animals. She dried Lillian with a towel and walked her over to the pump. Rosanna picked Lillian up and set her beside the sink, then picked up not the pail with the muck in it, but a pot she used for boiling egg noodles. She set it under the spout of the pump, lifted the handle, pushed it down, and did it again. Water clear water and cool, spurted into the pan, and she pumped again. Soon she had about three quarts. The pot held four. She realized that she had panicked. Dimly, in fact, she knew how a well worked. A well was a deep hole into an aquifer. Water seeping through the surrounding rock and earth filled the hole, and every well had a capacity, a gallon, a minute, or two, or ten, or whatever. But Rosanna had never in her 30 years seen anything come out of a spigot other than water, and so she had looked at the muck and panicked. Lillian was staring at the water, and Rosanna gave in to temptation and said, Well, darling, it's a miracle. Hmm. We prayed for water, and the water came. Rosanna knew that, water would, that Walter would disapprove of misrepresenting things in this way, but the words just came out of her mouth. Lillian stared at the water and said, a miracle. Rosanna took her down from the sink and said, let's go find Dula and Lizzie. I think they've been getting up to mischief. As they left the kitchen hand in hand, Rosanna saw Lillian turn her head to look at the pump. She did feel guilty a bit. But then, what was wrong with believing in miracles? Miracles abounded. There were plenty that you could see and plenty that you couldn't. Thank you, Jane. Hearing that, that reading reminds me of something Eloise said, not Rosanna. And Eloise is the sort of communist, yes. um, German, goyesha <laughs> communist married to a... Eloise is seven years younger than Rosanna. Yeah. And, but she says, um, the perennial question of motherhood was how honest to be, which is <laughs> such a fantastic notion and so, so um, resonated with me, not as a mother, but just as an observer of mothers. Um, so she... So Rosanna comes to, you know, believe that Jesus did some unaccountable things and to, to drift a little from that world. And that whole uh, thread of the novel is very interesting, her sort of crisis in faith. Well, uh, she, they take uh, the kids and they find a, a, a more, they've been going to Walter's old church, which is where the sermons are basically about um, 
the parking lot and repairs needed in the parking lot and what the, what's going to be done at Christmas. And they find a much more evangelical church that's farther away, which Walter doesn't want to go to because he doesn't want to be away from the farm. But um, uh, when Lillian is some years older, I guess she's about eight, um, they can, Rosanna can see Lillian beginning to take in the things that the, the preacher is saying, the sort of scary things that the preacher is saying. And this brings up an issue. I did a lot of research, and every so often I'd come across something, and I'd go, oh, well, I've got to get that in there. And one of the things that I came up with was a hurricane in Florida in the mid-30s. Mm -hmm. And so I made the preacher have a brother um, who is lost in that hurricane and then talks about it. And Lillian just takes it all in. And Walter and Rosanna look at each other and say, you know, we can't have our child be frightened like this. Mm. And there is, I think, a notion of kind of spiritual abuse of children in, in, in sort of those radical or orthodox environments. But that's a whole other discussion. Um, um, I'm saying nothing. Don't say a thing. Um, <laughs> but she, she, let's let's move let's move on from that um, to something totally. Although I just want to. It seems to me your having known you, the Bush years seem to um, impact your faith somewhat. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you tell them how I came up with this book because you were there. I was there. We were at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. In the, in the, eating, eating breakfast in that big room. Eating there. breakfast in that big room. I, we're sitting there eating breakfast, and I don't know why, or if it, I don't think anybody else was with us. And I said, I want to write a trilogy, and I want it to be called The Last Hundred Years. And David said, Don't tell anybody that title because somebody will steal it. And I thought, Oh, that is a good review. <laughs> and so I didn't tell anybody the title, and I went, uh, and I started writing within a couple of months after I told David that. And so I, so, and everything grew out of the title, because I knew that the years had to follow in sequence, that they had to be essentially equal, that I had to weave the stories um, into the years, and that the family the people in the family had to be born, grow up, do stuff, get old, die, you know, reproduce. More people were going to come along. And that really fascinated me to do it that way. And reading, reading Some Luck is fascinating. Some Luck by Jane Smiley, which is collapsing in my hands. Um, in that each chapter is told from a, a different year. So each chapter begins with a year. And so in, in this portion, there are 33 um, chapters. And the point of view is it's woven sort of, from yeah. different. And what's particularly unusual is that the children, like the baby children, have a point of view, which I've never seen before. <laughs> tell, me how, tell me how you were brave enough to do that and get away with it and, um, and what your thinking was around that. I have three kids of my own and two stepkids. And the thing that we, I noticed, um, I noticed this when baby number two was born that as soon as I held her in my arms, literally the day she was born, maybe two hours after her birth, she felt completely different from baby number one, the way her body was. Baby number one had been very self-contained and remained self-contained in, in how she approached the world. And th so they put baby number two in my arms, and she just sort of melted into my body, you know, which, which if you're exhausted, mom who just gave birth, makes you say, oh, wow, this is love. You know, this feels like love. And so that interested me about my kids. And then 10 years after that one, I had another one, and he was completely different from the first two. And so one of the things I really wanted to talk about was the inherent sort of temperament and perception of the various children. Oh, my editor stopped me from doing it too much. <laughs> <laughs> and I have noticed there's a kind of gender split on whether this is interesting. You know, some reviewers, mostly guys, think that the baby parts are sort of boring. And, uh, and other reviewers really like the baby parts. But, I, but there's war parts, too. So we can, if we have war parts, we can have baby parts, right? <laughs> 
if we have sex parts, then we can have cooking parts. You know, we can have. <laughs> and there is some, the, there's a very wonderful sex scene towards the end with um, two, uh, two people in their late 40s, early 50s, which in those days seemed really old, right? Well, they're, yeah, they're in their, yeah, they're in their 50s. Even their 50s. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's a lovely scene. And I, speaking of sex, I was interested that the novel was dedicated to four men. Yes, three, my husband. Three of whom you were, had been married to? All of them I've been married you to. You married to? Yeah, we're married now. Oh, you got married? Congratulations. <laughs> when but, did that, was that, did that happen sort of off the record? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The children know, but nobody no. else. Oh, well, now we all know. Well, <laughs> congratulations. That's very exciting. So to four different husbands, and it's, it, everyone seems to be... Well, they all helped in this book, because one of the things I realized last uh, winter was that each of my four husbands had this different area of expertise. And my first husband, who I chose um, as my boyfriend, because he was... Uh, I was down at Yale for a a girls' week there to see if the girls wanted to come there. But forget that. But anyway, <laughs> I opened the paper on Friday, and there was this guy on the basketball team, and he was really cute. I went over to his room, and I knocked on the door, and I said, I'm one of your millions of screaming fans, and he let me in. And <laughs> so he was a six foot 10 basketball-playing communist from Casper, Wyoming. <laughs> Absolutely unique in the history uh -huh. of the world. Right. I think. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so he was really smart, and he taught me a lot. Very intellectual, and um, and then, but but we were too tall, really. My mother was terrified that we would produce some seven foot, <laughs> you know, monster. <laughs> and um, so and so, my second husband. Uh, he was, my second husband is a guy, he was a musician, a guitar playing musician, bartender, but he's the one with the memory. So I'll call him up and I'll say, well, John's a lawyer now, and I'll call him up and I'll say, okay, I need to know about divorce law, blah, 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 and I need to know blah, 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 blah about um, this intellectual theory. And he'll say, oh, yeah, 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 and tell me. Steve, I'll call up and I'll say, do you remember when? And he'll say, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. I say, thank you. Um, and then my third husband, um, who got me pregnant on our first date. You sound date. like you can't quite remember him. No, no, I remember <laughs> him perfectly well. I just didn't want to admit that he got me pregnant on the first oh. date. <laughs> but <laughs> then you did. But why not? You know? uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> How soon did you marry him? Um, as soon as I discovered I was pregnant. Um, huh. But he... He is the, he was so the pop culture guy. Uh -huh. He was the pop culture guy. He grew up around New York. And he was one of those guys, those, they used to have those contests on the radio back in those days where they'd start playing a song and the first person who called up to and to say what the song was. And he was the guy who, as soon as they heard his voice, they slammed the phone down <laughs> because he knew every song after three notes or something like that. And so he was the... He was the pop culture maven, and he knew everything about Manhattan and everything about it. He was a very interesting guy. And, um, and then there's Jack. What, do we want to talk about Jack or not really? In... Uh, they're, kind, they're very <laughs> cute together, I have to say. I, I, when I first met them in Australia, before you were married, and I guess you hadn't known each other not that, that long. Not that long, no, about they were, two or three years. I remember you, they were all over each other. It was Still fantastic. Are, yeah. <laughs> but the um, thing is, Jack came to my house, and the thing I noticed about him was that he had a table saw. He came to do a repair, and he had a table saw, and he was mature, and he had all ten fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, this guy knows his way around tools. <laughs> And every girl with horses and a barn needs oh. somebody who knows the way around tools. <laughs> it's all making sense. So getting back to the novel. Yeah. Um, so there's a so the, there's a father in the novel, yeah, uh, Walter. Walter, who's who's a real farmer and he's dedicated to the world of the farm and he's a battler and he's fighting the weather and things aren't going well, um, and he knew he you say. Well, Walter says, Walter knew he was less and less able to imagine any other life. He was 30 now. His eyes lifted only as far as the next hill of corn. 
which is such a sort of an amazing, I mean, coming from a farm myself uh -huh. and knowing, having my, a father who's a farmer, um, I can see how that is and what, what a realization that is and sort of terrifying and comforting at the same time. Well, Tell Walter us about Walter. has been, Walter went away, so his, Walter was born in 1895 and um, he went away to the First World War um, in 1917 and he never fought or anything, but he did get to go to northern France. And so he has this feeling that he's been around, but he didn't, he couldn't stay away. And, um, and yet he's a worrier, much more so than, well, they're both worriers, but that's a natural, People that's, on the, farms that's worry. the way you have mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, at one point, um, Rosanna is thinking about um, the dangers of life on the farm, and and she thinks, you know, if people were honest, they would say they would count how many children need to be sacrificed in order to maintain the farm. Mm -hmm. And I just learned, you know, I lived in, I lived in Iowa City for a long time. I lived in Ames for a long time, and I would read the Des Moines Register, which had the farm section every Thursday, and I was always struck by this, um, uh, by on the dangers on, on one side and the dedication on the other, you know. Part of the time I was living in Iowa, uh, and this was the uh, inspiration for a thousand acres, I was living through a period where farmers were so indebted they were just committing suicide, and that would be in the paper. Mm -hmm. That was the late mm -hmm. 70s. Mm -hmm. So um, I was fascinated by the dangers of farming, by the dedication people had mm -hmm. to farming, by the by the way that they were always trying to solve one problem and then maybe coming up with mm -hmm. another because mm -hmm. they had solved mm -hmm. the first one. Mm -hmm. and, and then being told in church that, um, that the climate, the drought, is sort of the, the wrath of God, which mm -hmm. is also confusing to take that on as well. Like, yeah. you know, what, what have we done to deserve this? Um, I was also interested in the, the details are so bizarre and interesting, and I'm wondering how you came upon things, like are they things, you know, are the following things, things you knew or came upon in your research? Um, that no frogs in the creek were a bad thing as far as the climate was concerned, the weather. Well, that's meant that if there were no frogs in the creek, that meant there wasn't enough water, enough water in the water creek for frogs to, to live in. them. Yeah. And then, do you, I remember there's an exception like a badly sighted barn which is so great from a rural perspective, <laughs> like to be able to recognize when a barn is well sighted and when it isn't. Um, and then the Osage orange oh, the hedges. the Osage orange tree. That, um, in the 19th century, um, a lot of farmers came to Iowa from England and they looked at the landscape and they said, oh, this looks just like mm -hmm. Derbyshire or something like that, but some place more um, flatter and more toward the south west, I think, and they said, okay, we're going to have estates like we have, mm -hmm. uh, like, they, like they have back in England, and the fences are going to be hedges. Cornwall. Oh, Cornwall, okay. So there is a plant that you all got, uh, know about called the Osage orange tree, which is native to, um, say, Missouri, Arkansas, and so they would go and get Osage orange trees and, or hedges, and they would plant them as if they were going to have a hedge. But that period of English um, immigration sort of passed, they realized, no, it wasn't going to be like having a big estate in <laughs> rural mm -hmm. England. Mm -hmm. but, the Osage Orange, so, but the Osage Orange hedges lingered, and they were very difficult to eradicate because they had very deep roots, mm -hmm. and they had lots of thorns, mm -hmm. and so they become that's like a, sort of a scourge. Walter's nemesis mm -hmm. is right. the Osage Fight, Orange Right, fighting, <laughs> fighting the hedges. Um, also, I, I was, it was interesting, and maybe this is something that I kind of remember, that people cared less about birthdays, and birthdays weren't such a big deal, and some people didn't even know when they were born or care when they were born. Well, I think in the previous generations, I mean, mm -hmm. that Walter and Rosanna have come from... Um, Families that have stuck together, they have grandparents and great-grandparents, but there were plenty of, and I knew this from writing Private Life, there were plenty of people in, in rural Iowa and rural America who were orphans in the late 19th century, especially after the Civil War. Billy Sunday spent part of his life in an orphanage. And so there were people 
who just didn't have the records or hadn't kept track or hadn't been told what their birthday mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of these sort of historical artifacts, I, I wanted to get in there because I wanted to give a real sense mm -hmm. of, and I have to tell you my best reviews so far. Please, please tell us about your best reviews. So, so far. I was at a, giving a reading in San Francisco, and I gave the reading, and this guy, first guy um, to say anything, says, were you spying on my family? Mm -hmm. And he turned out to have been born in Iowa, born on a mm -hmm. farm, mm -hmm. and he believed every word. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, thank you, God. Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Okay, Mr. Canning, you do it. <laughs> um, and it's it's true that the landscape and the house become you know become a character. Um, that the, the it's sort of a mythic Gothic kind of notion of this <coughs> this homestead, Ooh, which is kind of shabby in a way, but but well kept. And the, there's a physical and psychic vortex around which the characters' lives revolve and swoop and swirl, a symbol of memory change and decay around this house and this, this farm, which at the, before, towards the end of this novel is kind of having a revival because mm -hmm. the son Joey is really um, a brilliant really farmer. Yeah, yeah, which is now always a great relief. Houses. There's two houses in the book. One of them is this house, um, and it's a very basic house, but the, the neighbor's house is a kit house from um, Montgomery Ward. It's a Montgomery Ward kit house. And when I was living in Ames, um, a book came out about kit houses. And a lot of those cities, um, or those towns in Iowa and other places too, um, were full of kit houses. And it fascinated me that these houses could come on the railroad and they had pages of instructions and all the nails were included, you know. And so I put a kit house in there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, just speaking with, about Walter a little more, um, I love the notion that um, he became a Democrat, and once he became, <laughs> and and once he became became a Democrat, um, he wasn't so bored of everything, which is such a, which is such an, an interesting observation. I'm wondering, in what sense do you think it's a, it's certainly a sort of social novel, and what's and an historical novel? In what sense is it political? I mean, there's the notion well, of Eloise and the communist element in yeah. the family. Well, everybody's making their way mm -hmm. as best they can. Mm -hmm. and, the, and farmers in Iowa have a kind of traditional way of looking at elections and politics. And some of it is very personal. I mean, there's at one point, um, Rosanna talks, gossips about Herbert Hoover, you know, mm -hmm. because where is he from? Well, he's from over in West Branch, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and so it's political in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, Eloise and her husband um, try to, Julius, his name is, he's from Chicago, but he's English. Um, and they are political in the, in the 30s way, and they have constant arguments about communism mm -hmm. and Trotskyism mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but Frank isn't political. No. And, um, and it's, it's interesting how the, the urban folks are more political than yes. the country folks. Yeah. Which maybe is a terrible generalization. But, but they, have it, ha they have opinions, mm -hmm. but they have really too much work, right. I think, right. to do much more mm -hmm. than talk mm -hmm. about. To be, yeah, there's too much work to be too political or too neurotic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Eloise, who's the, the communist aunt in Chicago, she says, almost everyone sees things, not everyone notices. And I was thinking... As a writer, um, I think you perceive the world in a very particular way. And I remember once talking about having looked at a letter or something that was a slight invasion of privacy, but you just said, well, you're a writer, that's what you're supposed to do, or something to that effect. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I, I do I mean, invade what, privacy all the time. How, yeah, how do, you, how do you feel about that, and how do you think you see the world as a writer? Well, it's so funny that you bring this up, because the other day I was... Um, <laughs> Uh, I was in Seattle, and I went into a used bookstore, and there was a copy of At Paradise Gate on the shelf of the used bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I haven't read that book since it came out. It came out in 1981. And um, so I, I bought it, and I started reading it, and I thought, geez, how could I do this to my family? It, it's, it's a kind of takeoff rendition 
about the death of my grandfather. And at the moment, to me right now, it seems simultaneously not quite them, but also mm -hmm. invasive of mm -hmm. their privacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the only thing I can say about that is that, that well, they forgave me for one thing, um, but that they also understood what was fiction and what was nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they also understood that, yes, they had told so many stories over the years that they were getting what they deserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, how could I not talk about the things that they had told mm -hmm. me about that had seemed so interesting to me as a child? So th what I always say is, you know, you have to worry about a little bit about the ones who don't want you to write about them. But then there's also the ones who you never wrote about who think, wasn't I interesting enough <laughs> right. for her to write about? I mean, you know? in my experience, my parents always say, you really nailed the other one. Like my mother would say, <laughs> you really nailed your father. But they don't see themselves, which is, which is kind of lucky. Um, yeah, I think, I think they're for, they've, my, <clears throat> they have been very forgiving, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so in some luck, just to finish up before we go to questions, the prose is sharp and the details are beautifully observed. Um, Jane, you allow us to luxuriate in the study of the characters and in the place and time where the novel is set. Um, and I was very touched by when the family assembles for one for Thanksgiving towards mm -hmm. the end of the novel and Rosanna, the mother, reflects, something had created itself for nothing. A dumpy old house had been filled, if only for the moment, with 23 different worlds, each of them rich and mysterious. So the, it's a a big kind of human adventure of a novel and a, and a, and a fantastic achievement, and we look forward to the, the rest and, and um, the other two uh, parts of the trilogy. And I just was also fascinated by you saying in your New Yorker piece, something from the, from the outside sometimes, my work and my life look daring, but I'm not a daring person. I'm just a person who was never taught what not to try. Well, see, I'm gonna write this book called The Blessings of ADD. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have been diagnosed with ADD, um, an, an ADD mouth breather. They would have diagnosed mm -hmm. me as that. Mm -hmm. And I, and the people who know me from school remember me kind of off in the corner going. <laughs> but I was paying attention, uh -huh. and I was taking note. Well, that, that, ability, <laughs> that ability to observe has served you well, and, and it's a great gift but for us. But if you're ADD, and they tell you, no, you can't do it, you don't even hear them. That's the blessing of That's, ADD. Well, there you go. That's the premise for the, the, next, the next novel. Yeah. Um, so before we go to questions, let's just um, give Jane a big round of applause. For, Thank you. For being so gracious. Thank you. And um, I see Ted up there has a has a microphone. If anyone has a question, can raise, raise your hand. Can we raise the lights a little so I can see people? We can't see a damn thing. Someone there in the second row. Yes. Stephen, yeah. It's very clear that place is a very important aspect of story to you, and I am I find myself wondering, because it's something that I question myself on, does story seem to come to you more out of a sense of place, out of reflecting on place, or do you have an idea for a story, and that leads you to the place where it should take place? Um, everything has come differently. Some, some things have come um, as ideas. Some things have come as, um, well, I, I guess I have to talk about specific things. So the Greenlanders came to me as a sense of place, or as because it only happened in Greenland what happened. And what, what happened was that I was talking to a friend of mine when I lived in Iceland, and he said, if you fell out of your boat in Greenland, you would freeze to death in five minutes. And I said, really? And we had read the Greenland sagas, and I thought, you know, somebody needs to write about Greenland. So, um, so that's how that came to me. That was definitely came from place. Um, horse Heaven came to me because I bought an old horse, and I lifted his lip, and he had a tattoo. So I sent off to the, which means he was race, he had raced. So I sent off to the jockey club, and um, they sent me his race records. And he had, he'd raced for years. He had 52 starts, and it won $150,000 or something like that. And he'd started in Germany, raced in France, raced in New York, raced in California. Um, 
and ended up in Chicago, I thought, boy, he's better traveled than I am. What was his name again in Mr. the novel? Oh, um, TikTok, or ter um, Mr. Mr. T. Mr. T, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he's the one with the front legs, right. the perfect front leg, um, which is why it was sound after 52 starts. And why we became such good yes. friends. Yes, <laughs> I thank him for many things. And um, so that wasn't exactly a sense of place, but it, there was this sense of, of mystery to where he'd been mm -hmm. and what it was like at the racetrack. Which is like an archaeological dig, which is what I tried to talk about <laughs> in that first interview. <laughs> um, next question. Tell me about revision. Do you like to revise? Do you revise a lot? Do you, what are you after when you revise? Um, revision uh, for me also is very uh, particular to that, that work, whatever it is. So some books have required almost no revision and some books have required a lot of revision. And, and it's what, the way I revise a book depends on its form. For example, when I was revising Moo, which takes place at a university and has a lot of characters, um, I had been, I had made myself a graph and it had the chapter titles across the top or the chapter numbers across the top and the character names down the side. And every time a character appeared in a chapter, I just put a check there. And so I could see that they, if somebody was getting lost, so I could make a chapter that would include that, that person. So when I revised it, um, I separated all the parts about each person, each character. I put them all together, read them at once, revised it so that um, that would have be continuous and logical, and then leave them back, interleave them again, and then read through it so that it would work from beginning to end. Sounds like ADD. <laughs> <laughs> Worked perfectly. Um, for Private Life, which was the most difficult of the books that I've written, and I didn't expect it to be, um, I did a lot of revising because it took me a long time to get into Margaret's inner life. Because Margaret's whole job in life was to not look within. She had been taught that as a child. She had um, had bad experiences that she couldn't remember without trauma. And, um, and then she was married to a guy, and if she really admitted how she felt about him, she wouldn't be able to live with him. So it took me a long time to figure out how to, and many revisions, to figure out how to talk about Margaret and her husband. So everyone has been different. Um, this one, there's a lot of research. So in order to incorporate the research, the books were a lot longer than they ended up being. And so the revision was a matter of cutting um, and taking out stuff that was just basically me talking to myself. <laughs> and so that, that, yeah, that, that took a while. But and, and Some Luck has a family tree in the beginning, which I must say when I first opened the book, I thought was slightly overwhelming. But the, the novel is so expertly written that I didn't need to refer to that. I knew who everyone was, even though that's it's quite a, a complicated, complicated family complicated. tree. That's a great That's a great compliment. Thank you. Any others? We have time for maybe two more. Okay. I just wanted to ask a little bit about the title, Some Luck. And I remember in the beginning of the book, I believe the first time I heard the words were when she was giving birth was to Frank. Wasn't there something about the, the doctor uh, coming in and he was drunk or something, but <laughs> it all went well anyway because he had done it so many times and then the phrase right. came out, some luck. Was there another, tell me about how you chose that title and what, how it's, refer, you know, what are the layers in the book about it? Um, I don't, you know, I think it just takes, it, they just have to have some luck in order to survive. Because um, I feel like that's been, that's the nature of life. Um, you can try and try and try and try and try and still something goes wrong. Or you can not try and not try and not try and still you happen to meet, you know, the person you love or the guy who thinks, you know, right? Yeah. Let me talk about it this way. 
I wrote a book called The Man Who Invented the Computer. It should have been called The Invention of the Computer because um, there were eight guys who were involved in the invention of the computer as we know it today. And it was an eye opener and a hair stander on end to see what these, the, the bits of luck mm. in the lives of these men that led to the computer as we know it. Um, one of them, who was a German guy during the war attempting to invent, invent the computer, um, he was, he, during the bombing of Berlin um, in 1945, he would be walking down to the basement where the bomb, where the computer was, and he would have to step aside as the bombs dropped through and took the stairs out. But he lived, and he lived to joke about it. And nearly every one of these guys, you just, nobody could write this as a novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, that just taught me something about the nature not only of my life, but just of life in general. So it, I is thought it some well, that's a way to start it. Like some luck? Or does that not ring I don't a bell? I kind of feel about. like it's some luck, you know? Um, well, that's love. a piece of luck, or yeah. they, we, got yeah. some, we had some luck, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know. And one I wrote a racing one. novel. Horse racing is all about luck. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Jane wrote a book called A Year at the Races, also, in addition to Horse Heaven, which is a, a non fiction account of a, a, a race horse's life. For a year. Uh, one final, final question. There it is. So I just read the article in The Guardian, and it piqued my interest about, um, well, many things. But one, I, w I wanted to ask about race, which you said was going to come up, has to come up mm -hmm. in your second novel, because the Civil Rights Movement is in it. Mm -hmm. And you also said, you know, history happens off stage in, in he Iowa. He did, yeah. So, um, From the point of view of an Englishman, it does in yeah. this book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to know if you could say a little bit more about the reaction in sort of this very homogenous offstage um, environment to something as huge as the civil rights movement. You know, is there a well, sense Well, I don't of want to talk about volume two. At all? <laughs> um, at all. No, okay. I don't want to talk about volume two at all. I want to keep the focus on volume one. But the, it, it was important to me to have these be regular people living out in the out in the middle of nowhere, um, and for their, um, f for what they did and what they thought to be typical of their place and time. So yes, Frank goes on the train to Chicago, and when he goes, and when he leaves, um, um, his mom tells him that, that black people prefer to be known as colored people, and that's what he needs to call them. You know, and, but that's almost all they know. You know, even when, when Roseanne, I mean, when Eloise marries Julius, th this is the first English person and maybe the first Jewish person they've ever met, you know, because they've lived such a circumscribed life. But all that changes in volume two. Everybody gets out of the house, everybody, most of them get out of Iowa, they go to other places, and... Um, and all hell not, breaks loose. Well, <laughs> it's not that they engage with the civil rights movement intentionally, it's that they're swept up in all kinds of events um, that are historical events. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ted. Jane will be signing books outside. <laughs>